So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be studying the first six verses of the chapter uh, this evening. And in many ways, uh, this, this evening's sermon takes us back to the old English exam papers, or maybe a history exam paper. You know that standard question that used to come up? Compare and contrast two figures from history. Compare and contrast two characters in a novel. Compare and contrast two poets or two poems by one poet. And compare and contrast, in a sense, sums up what the author's doing here in Hebrews chapter 3 in the first six verses. That's really what he's been doing all along, comparing and contrasting Jesus to the prophets and to the angels. And here he does it with Moses, but it's, it's very obvious that that's what he's doing. For the Jewish people, two figures stand massive in their history. Two giants. One is the father of the nation, Abraham. The other, sorry, one is the father of the people, Abraham. And the other is the father of the nation, Moses. Moses was the great liberator, the great lawgiver, the great leader the great intercessor. He was the man who went head to head with Pharaoh and spoke face to face with God. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Moses wrote that the first five books of our Bibles, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. I remember coming across an interview with some Israeli politicians Uh, The current Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, said Moses was the greatest revolutionary of all time. Remember that in antiquity there were grand empires that were based on one principle, slavery. And Moses challenged that twice. He challenged it by taking his people who were slaves in bondage in Egypt, freeing them and taking them to their promised land. But Moses, Netanyahu says, also challenged the empires of the world by providing a moral code for mankind that said it is not the king or the emperor who decides the law. There is a higher law. These, he said, were absolutely revolutionary ideas. In the same series of interviews, Shimon Peres, a former president of Israel, was asked, What is so significant about the Exodus story? And he said, well, one is clearly the view of Moses. He remains without any competition, the greatest legislator of all time. And as for the Ten Commandments that he brought down from Sinai, it is the foundation of our civilization. So here then is Moses, a massive figure in the Bible, a massive figure in the views even of current world leaders. Whenever we look at the Bible, we find that Abraham, that the father of the people, is mentioned about 300 times by name. Jacob, about 360. Moses, 800 and more times. Only one human figure outstrips him, and that's David. 970 plus times. But even with David, Moses is mentioned more frequently in the New Testament than David. But why is he mentioned here in Hebrews? Well, these Jewish Christians to whom the writer is communicating were thinking of returning to Judaism, to Moses and to the Mosaic laws and sacrifices. They'd met trials and persecution. They'd been harassed by family and former friends. They had been thrown out of the synagogue. They had been victimized. Property had been taken off them. They had been imprisoned. They were discouraged and disheartened. The old ways seemed a better, safer option. They seemed to offer more. After all, Moses had founded the nation. And who was Jesus, really? What did they know of Jesus? And what was his role compared to Moses? Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai to speak with God. 
Jesus went to the cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It seemed so much surer and safer to go back to Moses. And again, in this section, it, the writer is seeking to help us see Jesus, to see him in his greatness. And that's how these people are going to endure. They will endure. They will keep going, he says, by fixing their thoughts on Jesus. And the author wants to help us to do that. And he does it not by running Moses down, which he could have done because Moses had his flaws and his failures, some of which were pretty spectacular. He does so by speaking of Moses' strengths, God-given strengths, and then showing that Christ is greater, better even than that again. Just in passing, there's a lesson here for how we debate and discuss. Sometimes we want to show the faults and failures of another religious system, whatever it might be, or the, the religious beliefs of those around us. But here the writer he doesn't show the faults and the failures. He shows the exceeding greatness of Jesus. And that's what we should do most often. Is set out to people the richness, the richness of knowing Christ. And that's what this author does. He has five titles or descriptions or areas which he compares and contrasts either directly or by implication. And so we're going to look at these five areas. He speaks of Jesus and Moses, either directly or indirectly, as an apostle, as high priest. He speaks of their faithfulness. He speaks of their status as sons and servant. And he speaks of them speaking, or about what they spoke of. And so we're going to look at each of Moses and Jesus in turn. First of all, I want us to see Moses' greatness. Moses' greatness. And really, the readers of this didn't need to be convinced of this, but we need to, to grasp it. We need to take ourselves back because Moses isn't front and centre in our histories, in our thinking, the way it would have been for these Jewish Christians. What made Moses so great? Let's take those five things. Moses was, first of all, sent to save. He was sent to save. The writer speaks of Jesus as the apostle and high priest of our confession, our confession, our faith. And then he says that he was faithful in these tasks just as Moses was faithful. So we're to understand that Moses was a faithful Apostle. Apostle just means one who was sent. One who was sent to carry out a message and to carry out a mission. Moses was sent. He was sent to save. And boy, was he ever sent. Go back to Exodus chapter 3 and you'll see the story of him being sent. He's tending flocks in the wilderness and he sees a bush on fire. But strangely, it's not being burnt up. And he goes over to investigate this phenomena. And God calls to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. And we read in Exodus 3 that God said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Then Moses says to God, Suppose I go and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. They ask, Well, what's his name? What shall I tell them? And Moses is told by God, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And then he says, uh, later on in chapter 3, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. And that word sent appears five times in six verses. Moses was sent. He was sent as God's instrument of salvation. 
to bring freedom to the people. And that he did. He acted on God's sending. He was the apostle. He went to Pharaoh and brought the message and he brought the people out. Moses was sent and the Jewish people owed their salvation to the one who was sent. He was the apostle of their salvation. But also he was a priest who prays. He is a priest who prays. It's true that Aaron had the office of high priest, but Moses was the one who represented the people to God. He was the one who was their advocate. He was the one who prayed for them. Remember when the Amalekites came against the people, and what did Moses do? He prayed on their behalf on the mountaintop, and they won the battle. Remember the wickedness when Aaron made a golden calf for the people, and God was going to destroy them. And Moses gave himself to 40 days of prayer. What an incredible man. God had said he would wipe out the people. He would destroy them. We sang of that in Psalm 106. But what did Moses say? He said, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. What prayer? What prayer from Moses? He was a faithful high priest who pleaded for the people. And he was faithful under pressure. We're told that he was faithful in all God's house. And that's a a phrase that's taken from Numbers chapter 12. Moses, God said, was faithful in all God's house. Sometimes the pressure that he faced came from the people around him. But sometimes the pressure uh, came from much closer to home, his own family. And in Numbers 12, his brother and sister started a whispering campaign against him. As if it wasn't bad enough, it was targeted at him because of his wife. She was from the very powerful Cushite people who had had a, a huge empire. And it's roughly analogous today to where Sudan and and Ethiopia is. Some commentators think the issue is simply that of racism, that she was of darker skin. But that doesn't seem to be it because their comments in Numbers 12 seem to suggest that Moses, they think, has gotten ideas above himself. Um, In Numbers chapter 12, verse 2, they say, has Moses, or sorry, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked, hasn't he also spoken through us? And they attack his ministry as well. They attack Moses, his wife, Moses' ministry. And did Moses lose the rag? I think after all of that, what Moses had been through, if it had been me, I would have thrown the towel in and walked away. But he was so humble, so filled with humility, uh, that God himself had to intervene And he commends Moses for his faithfulness and he condemns their unfaithfulness in Miriam and Moses and God himself defends Moses. His faithfulness was proverbial. In Exodus, the last five chapters, there are 22 references to Moses' faithfulness. What a man. Faithful under colossal pressure. So we're beginning to get a picture of the greatness of Moses the high priest and the one sent to bring about salvation and faithful under immense pressure. And then we're told he's a servant in God's house. A servant in God's house, in God's family. He did what God asked them to do. He babysat God's disobedient nation, Israel. He served as no human being had ever served. He served as a spokesman for God. He served as an intercessor for the people, as a giver of the law, as an organizer of the nation, as a a conveyor of plans for the tabernacle and its sacrifices, as a judge of the people, an arbiter of disputes, a leader of the nation, as a writer of the word, as a composer of psalms, an astoundingly gifted man, a servant who was willing to put everything on the line. Remember he said, blot me out. Spare them. What a servant in God's house. 
And he, he spoke. Here's the fifth one. He spoke about things to come. Here's another part of Moses' greatness. Verse 5. He testified to what would be spoken by God in the future. He spoke of things to come. In Genesis chapter 3, he spoke of the one who would crush the head of the serpent. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, he spoke of a great prophet who would arise from amongst the Israelites whom they must listen to. And he's pointing forward to Jesus. He spoke of things to come in all that he gave to the Israelites. Their worship was a pointer to Christ. He gave them the ABC picture book that illustrated what sin was, what forgiveness was, what atonement was, what holiness was, what fellowship was. He spoke of the glories to come. That was his role. He spoke of these great things. And he showed them in who he was and what God did through him. He was a great signpost to Jesus. Here then is the greatness of Moses the Apostle, the High Priest, the Faithful One, the Servant in God's family, and the One who showed Christ. Well, that brings us secondly then, if that's Moses' greatness, we have to coin a word here. Secondly, we see Jesus' greaterness. Jesus' greaterness. Moses' greatness highlights Jesus' greaterness. Here we compare and contrast every point. At every point, Jesus is shown to be of greater honour. So let's take those five things again. Sent to save. The apostle and high priest of our confession. This phrase pulls together chapter 1 and chapter 2. In chapter 1 we have Jesus the divine spokesman, superior to the prophets and the angels. He is the one who is sent to speak. And then in chapter 2, he's the one who's the great suffering high priest. He's the one who comes to save. That's why chapter 3 starts with therefore. Since that is who Jesus is, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the one who's sent to save. But this is the only time in the Bible Jesus is called an apostle. How is it that he's sent? Might be the first time and the only time he's called an apostle, but it's not a new thought. In John's Gospel, Jesus repeatedly refers to himself as being sent, sent by the Father. My food in John 4 34, he says, is to do the will of him who sent me. John 5 23, whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. John eleven forty two. I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Sent to do the Father's will. Sent to teach and to die. And in doing so, he was sent to free us from a greater slavery than Moses was. Slavery to death. Slavery to sin. We've seen that in chapter 2. And slavery to him who holds the power of death. Moses only rescued us from physical slavery and an earthly death sentence. But Jesus rescued from a spiritual slavery and an eternal death sentence. He was sent to save at a much deeper, more significant, eternal level. Secondly, he's a priest who prays. We see that in chapter 2 and verse 17. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. He was tempted and he suffered and he's able to help those who are being tempted. And Moses, for all his amazing intercession or prayer, doesn't come near. He couldn't identify with the people. He hadn't been a slave. He hadn't felt the taskmaster's lash. But we have one who was tested in every way and was, is able to help when we are tempted. We have a high priest who prayed for us in his lifetime on earth, who prayed for us on the cross, and who prays for us now 
in the presence of his Father. Go and listen to him praying in Gethsemane. Go and listen to him on the cross. Go and sing in the Psalms of the prayers of Christ and see his prayers for you and hear of him praying now in the presence of the Father. What a high priest we have who prays for us. And then he was faithful. But again, here's the contrast. Moses was faithful under pressure. Jesus, in the third place, is faithful unto death. Moses was famous for being faithful, for doing what God asked him. But oh, what faithfulness we see in Jesus. In John 17, he prays, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Moses was faithful under immense pressure. Jesus was faithful under far greater pressure, asked to do something far beyond what Moses was ever asked to do. Moses was asked to bear the Israelites, as it were, on his shoulders through the wilderness. At least that's what he, he complained about, that God had asked him to carry these people. But Jesus not simply had to carry his people, but the sin of his people and to carry the punishment of the sins of his people. And he was faithful. He was faithful in fulfilling all the predictions and all the prophecies of Scripture. He was faithful in all his obedience as a child, as a teenager, as an adult. He was faithful when Peter drew a sword and wanted to hack his way through those who came to arrest Jesus. He was faithful when Judas was betraying him. He was faithful when Peter was denying him and the religious leaders were lying about him. Jesus was faithful to the task the Father gave him. He was faithful when the religious leaders taunted him, come down and then we'll believe. He was faithful to his own mission and not to his honour. To his honour, he could have come down to say, look, I am who I claim to be, but we would have been damned we needed him to stay on the cross. And he stayed there, faithful, faithful. He was faithful as his father acted as judge and poured out the full measure of wrath that our sins deserved. He was faithful. And he far excels Moses. Compare and contrast. We look at Moses and think, how did he put up with those Israelites? We must look at the son and say, how did he put up with our sin? And how did he stay on that cross? Faithful unto death. Fourthly, he was a son. Remember Moses was a servant in God's house? Well, here's the contrast. Jesus is a son over God's house. What a servant Moses was. But the author says of Jesus, he was in a different category. He was a son. Moses was under the king, in the house. Jesus was a son of the king and over the house. In fact, he goes further than that. He calls him the builder of the house. Moses was, was only part of the, the house, the family. He was in God's house, verse 5. But verse 4 is saying that Jesus is God. Because he is the builder of the house. And God is the builder of everything. And Jesus is the builder of everything. Moses was part of the house. Part of the family. Jesus creates the family. That's why the writer starts off in verse 1. Calling us holy brothers. Therefore holy brothers. He's not addressing us and them as his holy brothers. But he's referring back to chapter 2 and verse 10 where we are called holy brothers, where we are made holy by Jesus, and he delights to call us brothers. That's what Jesus does. And we are part, verse 6, of Jesus' house. That's significant. Particularly for these Jewish readers, they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue, what the Jewish people thought of as God's house. But they won't be cast out of God's house. They are God's house. Jesus has made them that. 
And he's made us that part of the very building in which God dwells, part of the very family of God. Verse 10 of chapter 2 speaks of bringing many sons to glory. Chapter 3, verse 1 speaks of sharing in a heavenly calling. That's what he's done for us. Moses, Moses saw God's glory. Jesus brings us to God's glory. Jesus is the builder and brother maker and the glory bringer. How could people go back to Moses? Here is Jesus' greater greatness. He has made you and me part of the family. Part of the family. Part of God's family. And then, remember how Moses spoke about things to come? Here's the contrast. Fifth thing to note here. He was the one who was to come. Jesus was the one who was to come. Moses had spoken about the future. Jesus was the future. Jesus was everything that Moses' life and ministry and writing had been pointing forward to. And the folly of going back to Moses was that it would prove that you hadn't heard Moses. Everything about him pointed forward. The point of Moses was to point to Jesus. Moses' rescue from Egypt was a picture of the great rescue to come. The tabernacle that Moses built was to point us to God dwelling with his people in Jesus Christ who came and tabernacled amongst us so that God would come and bring us to live with him forever. Moses taking the people to the promised land was a picture of God through Jesus bringing us to the new heavens and the new earth. You know how you, when you go to the cinema there are trailers for the full film yet to come. Would you settle for watching the trailer of an eagerly expected film? Well that's what these people were saying. Let's go back to the trailer. We don't want to watch the full film. We'll just settle for watching the trailers. Or it would be a bit like Marking out the foundations of a house, digging and pouring the concrete and you can see the form of all the rooms. There's the living room and the kitchen and the, the bedrooms, there they are. And they're all marked out there and everything is pointing to the future house. And then somebody says, well you know what, I think we'll not do any more. We'll just live here as it is. That's what it would be to ignore that Moses was pointing to the fullness. And to go back to Moses would be to miss out on everything that he was pointing to. Jesus is everything that this whole Old Testament is pointing for to. Moses, the greatest, and all the other writers were pointing to. This is what God was planning for millennia. This is why the universe exists. Here then is Jesus' greatness. Here then is Jesus excelling Moses in every way. As we read the Old Testament and see Moses, we need to see him as a signpost to Jesus. And we need to remember that Jesus was Moses' saviour too. Moses may have preceded the incarnation and he may have pointed forward to Jesus, but Moses was depending on Jesus to get him, Moses, to heaven. Just the same as the rest of us. And so this is why our author tells us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. In verse 1, to fix our thoughts on him. And that brings us in conclusion to our great challenge. The third thing to see here is our great challenge. The whole of Hebrews is about enduring. But how are we to endure? Well, the writer says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. And as you do that, that will enable us to hold on, verse 6, to this hope boldly. And so there's our two challenges. And it's as we do the first that we are helped to do the second. We are to contemplate. Here's the first part of it. Contemplate Christ. Contemplate Christ. Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Consider him. The, the word here means to give yourself to study something, 
to take particular notice. Jesus uses it in Luke 12, 24 and 27. He says, consider the ravens, consider the lilies. He wants us to look at them and to draw conclusions from looking at them. And the same here. And our author has set out such a catalogue and painted such an art gallery of the images of Jesus in his glorious divinity in chapter 1 and the wonder of his humanity in chapter 2 that we are to give ourselves to doing what he has done. You know, where do you think chapters 1 and 2 came from? I believe fully that the Holy Spirit gave God's word to these writers, but I think we should perhaps think of this man the way the Holy Spirit brought it about, this man had been, instead of sitting there and one day it all coming suddenly and mysteriously into his head from nowhere and him beginning to write, in the past God spoke to our forefathers in various ways, I think this man had been meditating on Jesus and considering Jesus. He's living in a tough time too, but how is it he is enduring well, he has fixed his eyes on Jesus. And I wonder if here, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he is sharing with these people what he himself had been meditating on and considering himself. He says again in chapter 12, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I think that's his own motto. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Come on, he says to himself. Like the psalmist in Psalm 103, O oh, thou my soul, bless God the Lord. And don't forget all his benefits. Be stirred up, my soul. This man stirs up his soul and says, come on, soul, fix your eyes on Jesus. And now he says it to us, to us. And he's, he's given us the fruit of his fixing his eyes on Jesus. He's modeled for us what to do. And this is what we're to do. And this man, this man shows us how to do this. One writer says, the truth about Jesus cannot be understood by a careless or occasional glance. We're not going to get this just by glancing at Jesus. We've got to think. We've got to engage our minds. Another writer says, if we're to make progress to maturity in Christian living, some time in each day must be devoted to careful consideration of the person and teaching and work of Christ. That's what we're to do. Not just a casual reading of the Bible to salve our conscience and say, I did my Bible reading, but a desire to see Jesus. How do we do that? Let me give you three things. One, start off with asking God to help you see Jesus. We'll sing in a moment from Psalm 27, One thing I have the Lord desired and will seek to obtain, that all days of my life I in the Lord's house may remain, that I, the beauty of the Lord, behold me and admire. This is what I'm asking for. Lord, help me to see more of Jesus. And then look, look to see more of Jesus. Look to see more of Jesus in the Gospels. Look to see more of Jesus, Jesus in the Epistles. Look to see more of Jesus in the Old Testament, in the sacrifices, in the people that were signposts and pointers to Jesus, David and Moses and Samson and Joshua and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. In the Psalms, ask to see and look to see more of Jesus. There you can get a glimpse into the very heart and mind of Christ. Think of Jesus and how he deals with you. See more of Jesus in your own salvation and in his daily dealings with you and his patience and his forgiveness. Look, look. So ask and look and keep at it. Discipline yourself. Ask and aim to see more of Jesus each day. One more thing. Show me something more of Jesus today. As you assemble the jigsaw pieces of Scripture, as you grow, as we grow in our knowledge, and as we connect pieces together, we'll see more of Jesus. And we'll see that he's bigger than we thought. He's better than we thought. He's greater than we thought. He's more loving, more patient, more gracious, more kind than we ever imagined. It'll take time and effort but it's going to be rewarding. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, he says. Fix your focus on him. We often focus on the problems of life, 
on the difficulties we face, sickness or the future or sin or loneliness or circumstances, they seem big to us. And they always will, unless we fix our thoughts on Jesus. And that will help us live for him when we feel overwhelmed. You know, we mightn't be thinking of going back to Judaism or to Moses. But we can let things discourage us and dishearten us. But not if we fix our focus on Jesus. Consider Christ. Consider him. And there's a challenge there to you this evening if you're not yet a Christian. In Numbers 12, God says, Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses. God was angry when they spoke against Moses. How much more angry do you think God must be at someone who rejects Jesus, who in their own head or heart or even with their mouth says, no, I'm not interested in Jesus. The anger of the Lord burned against them, we read, about Miriam and Aaron for speaking against Moses. So my dear friend, if you're not yet trusting in Christ, come and put your trust in this great Saviour so that the Lord's anger won't burn against you. Consider, consider Christ. I, I plead with you. And then the second thing is hold on to the hope that Christ brings. Hold on to the hope Christ brings. As you fix your focus on him, this will help you hold on to him. To hold on to your hope and to do so with boldness. And we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory or the hope in which we boast. We are his house if. How do those two go together? Are we in or are we not? Well remember that the writer is always looking with human eyes at our profession. Paul often looks at our profession of faith with God's eyes and tells us that it's secure and certain, and it is in God's eyes. But you and I can't see to the heart. And the proof that God has started a work in us is that we keep going in the life that God has given to us. And so the writer says we are God's house if we keep on going. We hold on. And so the challenge to us is to keep holding on. Don't back down. Don't back off. Keep going. Keep holding on to your hope no matter what's thrown at us. People who are heaven bound are holding on people. And so this is our challenge. To fix our eyes and our thinking on Jesus. And that will keep us going. Because he will amaze us. And we will be amazed at the depths of God's love for us. And we will be convinced that he can be trusted with everything. And so if you find your grip on Christ loosening, and you find yourself drifting in your faith, go and fix your thoughts on Christ. See him in all his divinity, all his majestic glory. See him coming to be the high priest who will be the sacrifice for your sin. Be amazed. And say to God, show me Jesus. Show me Jesus. And as you're amazed, you'll be convinced that he can be trusted with everything. And you'll be convinced that he does everything for good. And you'll be convinced that he will come back and take you to be with him where he is. And you'll hold on because you'll be convinced that he's worth it. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great portrait that you painted in Moses of a rescuer and of a, a priest who would pray for the people in astonishing ways with great commitment. And we, we thank you for his faithfulness. And yet we see Moses the giant utterly dwarfed by the majestic Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And so help us as we look at Moses in Scripture or we look at Joshua or we look at David to see them dwarfed by the mighty Jesus Christ, our Saviour. As we're amazed at Moses' patience, as we're amazed at the rescue that different people bring in Scripture, let us see with 
New Testament eyes that Jesus is better, that he's greater, and that all of these people are little lenses that magnify Christ for us and give us a new glimpse of Jesus. Help us to hold on by fixing our thoughts on him. We ask it, and we ask that you would show us more of Christ. Show us more of Christ each day, we ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.